Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. The texts for this week, January 17th, 2020, are 1 Samuel 3, verses 1 through 10, or you can read all the way through 20. Psalm 139, verses 1 through 6 and 13 through 18. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 12 through 20, and the Gospel of John, verse, chapter 1, verses 43 through 51. Guess what I'm going to say? I know it. <laughs> you have to add verses. Yes! But you don't, I mean, you don't necessarily have to read them, but the preacher needs to pay attention to the fact that uh, this whole narrative of the call of the disciples uh, occurs, begins in verse 35. And, uh, and, and the reason to, to go back and look at those verses is that you, it, two of the really critical themes of this, of this passage are really begin there in terms of uh, the language of come and see the invitation that that uh, this is what Jesus then says to uh, to the disciples, John's disciples who are following him. And yeah. then Philip says the same thing. Which okay. if I were going to give a hashtag to uh, the gospel that comes out of here, it would be hashtag come and see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, of course, the Samaritan woman says the same thing to So it's a it I, is. Oh, man, I was going to do hashtag under the fig tree. <laughs> we are going to hashtag this one. Keep going, Caroline. No, but it 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 becomes a it it's a really important invitation or language of invitation, particularly for John, but also helping people think about. I think in the season of Epiphany, uh, this that that could be your whole theme for Epiphany. Come and see that you know the Epiphany is about revelation and manifestation, and what is it that you see about Jesus? And uh, and it and it becomes the primary act of of witnessing in this gospel uh, that are testifying to Jesus to come and see what I experienced with Jesus or my this was my encounter with with Jesus uh, and and come and see to have your own encounter uh, and to enter into that relationship. So that's the one thing, and then the other uh, is uh, the language of of finding which we get in um, the next part of that chapter. So, uh, so we get one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, this is in verse 40. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah. And then Jesus in verse 43, he found Philip. So this language of finding too is all caught up with, of, with discipleship. And uh, that, that part of the trajectory for uh, the Gospel of John anyway, but, uh, but when we think about what will, what will happen going forward is, uh, is, is this necessity of going to places and finding, uh, finding and inviting more people into, uh, into the presence of Jesus. And so, uh, which is critical for the question, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And so we could say, could anything good come out of Samaria? And that's exactly where Jesus goes first, to find the woman uh, at the well. And when the blind man is thrown out in 934, Jesus finds him. So it's, it's the, it has this broader category of of this is this is not only what Jesus does, but notice that the first finding is uh, by Andrew finding his brother Simon. So this is this is our task as well, not just Jesus. This is not just Jesus, the calling of the disciples, but we are to engage in that calling as well. Uh, for the sake of John 3:16 and John 10:16, I have another sh other sheep that are not of this fold. So. This, yeah, so this calling is, is our, our task as well. It's not just about, it's not just one way Jesus um, calling the disciples. Then we are tasked with finding disciples as well. So that's my first point. <laughs>
Can I, I ask love a question? Our, oh, go for it. Go for it, Matt. So um, I, I, it's really helpful, the, all of the individual encounter, finding, seeking. When it comes to reading this text in Epiphany, and for people who want to spend time on, on what Epiphany means and this whole notion of how, how will the Christ be manifested or known, can you help with what it means that Jesus is the one about whom Moses in the law and the prophets wrote. I get that for the prophets, but to speak about, and John does this in other places too, where, where um, somehow Jesus is prefigured in, in Torah and how that connects to, the, to, to Jacob's dream that's, that's referenced here about angels ascending and descending on the son of man. Mm -hmm. can, you say, like, can you say more about the point of that for this text? And I hope this isn't an arcane question. I mean, it's really this idea so, of how are these supposed to people, people supposed to know who the Messiah was and, and what yeah. does it mean to draw on Moses in particular for that? Well, that, that's going to, uh, you know, this, this was already referenced back in, in the prologue. Uh, you know, Moses was already referenced back in the pro prologue where we have in verse 17, the law indeed was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And so, which is not a discounting of the law as it is a, it, it, to what extent this is John's sort of fulfillment language of the continuity of uh, just as God, uh, just as God revealed God's self and God had a relationship with, with Moses and the prophets, this is now happening through Jesus. So I think that's the first part, but the way in which John then goes forward and, and so much of his interpretation of, G, of who Jesus is, uh, is cast in uh, these Old Testament narratives. So for example, John 6, there is no John 6 without Moses in the wilderness uh, with, with God's people and the provision of manna. And there's really no John 7 with, um, without Jesus, Jesus really talking about himself being the living water in John 4 and John 7 without thinking of uh, the rock being split and water coming out. So there's this, there's this, uh, does that make sense, Matt, that there's this sense of, and particularly uh, for John, that uh, this is, this is God revealing God's self in a very particular way. Uh, and, um, and it's not to, it's not to discount the law and Moses and the prophets. It's saying it, you really have to put this in, in conversation with 118. No one has ever seen God. It is God, this only God, or this now unique God, right? Uh, it's a begotten God who is at the father's, um, heart, who is making God known. And so manifesting God, revealing God. So, uh, it's, it's, um, it, that's what it's being cast, cast with, if that, is that helpful? And if you, if you keep going, uh, Caroline, in chapter nine, um, where, uh, the, uh, Pharisees are saying, you know, we know about Moses and, 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 uh, and Jesus comes back. And, and basically is saying, are, do they really, you know, because if they had understood who Moses was and what Moses was saying, they would recognize him. So it, it, it's all the way through mm -hmm. uh, the audience that, uh, that Jesus addresses mm -hmm. throughout the Gospel of John. Mm -hmm. it, uh, two things, two more things uh, about that. One, one is an, um, the, the issue of an Israelite in whom there is no deceit, right? And that is that, you know, the belief was that sins passed down through generations and mm -hmm. Jacob, who had been deceitful, then, you know, that there's a reference in Hosea really kind of blaming the, all the people for inheriting that um, flaw. Um, mm -hmm. but, but the fig tree, I remember Craig Kester, gosh, 25 years ago, I asked him about that, uh, our colleague, and um, he, he, he mentioned then a reference that that's also being seen under the fig tree. There's some Old Testament reference to that. And I can't remember what that is. Do you remember that, Caroline? Well, uh, it's really kind of unknown. I mean, that, that what's the point of that fig tree? I mean, what's the reference? I mean, the, the, one of the reasons for the reference to the fig tree is uh, that Jesus has insight, you know, that other other that 
that is unusual. <laughs> um, Jesus is able to see things, but I don't know what the reference is. I mean, I don't, yeah. And I know in Zechariah, I mean, the come and see, right? That in Zechariah 3.10, you shall invite each other to come uh, under your vine and fig tree. I mean, uh, that that mm. might be, but anyway, uh, the point is that this is in some way messianic fulfillment. Yes, the promise is exactly that, uh, that what we have here is that Jesus is being identified as the one who fulfills promises from yeah. scripture. And, uh, and, and so that then gets continued then throughout the, uh, throughout the gospel, as Joy was saying. Is that, did I answer your question, Matt? Did I? Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I, I think what you're saying, and I wasn't wondering about this being, you know, necessarily a repudiation of the law, but you, you talked about narratively that it seems that, I, like Luke and Acts, I think, for example, narratively is way more interested in connecting to the Deuteronomistic history. But here you've got a sense where it's it's Genesis, I think, in particular, that's a really mm -hmm. important Exodus as well, but but is a really important narrative for kind of anchoring. Mm -hmm. Jesus' own trajectory or Jesus' own place in the trajectory of God's dealing with God's people. Is that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fair? And I think, and I think with John too, it's uh, the way in which that trajectory is expanded going back to John 1, 1 in the beginning. And so there's this, this, that, 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 that Jesus presence or, and, or God, uh, God eventually revealing God's self or becoming flesh was from the very beginning of time. And so, uh, and so really tying all of that together of how does God reveal God's, how did God reveal God's self to, you know, Moses and then. Isn't, isn't there a debate about the incarnation in John? <laughs> that we talked about, when was that? Oh, Last week, oh we two talked weeks about ago? that two weeks ago, sorry. We did talk about that two weeks ago. Uh, yeah. Can I ask one, uh, one more thing? Follow me. Um, he found Philip and said, follow me. Um, one of the, for a lot of Christians who are um, really ticked off and alienated by the church, that concept has uh, been, uh, come as a, a welcome identity marker. They say, you know, they won't say I, I'm a member of a church or even that I'm a Christian, but I'm a follower of Jesus. I mean, uh, so um, I'd be curious about how, uh, what all you guys think about um, following Jesus uh, in the Gospel of John uh, as a marker, but that might be a helpful thing, uh, place uh, to, uh, I even have a friend um, who sadly has lost all of his theistic faith, um, but he goes to church and he says, I follow Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that idea, I think, is some sort of, uh, refuge for people who are either alienated by the church or um, by the, uh, think they have to um, conform themselves to a belief system. Behind that question, uh, before uh, um, I'll turn to Matt and, and Caroline to maybe address it, um, but in the reverse of that was um, the question of Gandhi. Uh, Gandhi's rejection of Christianity was the failure of those who claimed to follow Jesus, to in any way bear witness to Jesus and the things that Jesus did in their context. Um, so I really appreciate that question, Ralph. Matt, what do you think about follow me? Uh, what do I think about it? I, I, mm -hmm. You know, he's, he's gathering disciples. I, I mean, I think it's, I, I tend to associate followership more with Mark Mm -hmm. uh, because in Mark, nobody seems to ever believe or have faith correctly, but that Jesus keeps asking them to follow, follow, follow. And, uh, you know, John's gospel uh, will, of course, conclude, maybe not conclude, maybe conclude at the end of chapter 20, come close, close to concluding, talking about believing, right? That believing seems to be a more important thing for John and, and belief is more than just, you know, intellectual consent. But mm -hmm. there is this idea of of following Jesus being at the heart of things. In some of my writing, I speak of Christ followers in the first century. That's just a way of helping remind people that Christian was not a separate identity from Judaism in the first century, that you could, you could and the, the idea of that name Christian took a while to develop, but even Christ follower is not a great term. Christ believer might be better. It depends on which New Testament author you're looking at, but mm -hmm. 
but I don't know. I think in this case, they're going to believe in him by the, uh, by what, the 10th verse of chapter two, if I remember correctly, after the, the wedding, uh, they're going to have glimpsed his glory. I mean, the, it doesn't take long for the followers in John to be fully on board. Doesn't mean they understand everything, but they're pretty on board. Mm -hmm. And but, it won't go mm -hmm. away, right? Isn't, isn't John where Peter says, you know, where else are we going to go, right? You got the words of eternal life. That, mm -hmm. But they, but they will, like in, you know, in at the end of chapter six, there's some who choose not to and go away. Uh, but I, I think the other aspect of following in this gospel, in particular, uh, is is what it's for the sake of. That it's not just for the sake of following Jesus, but it really is for the sake of, at least I think, um, it's for the sake of whether or not John three sixteen will really come to fruition. So, so, so after, you know, after John three, uh, the disciples are then find themselves following Jesus into Samaria. And um, why do they go to Samaria to find more disciples? And, and, and in the case of, in the case of Jesus finding the woman at the well, who ends up being really the first witness. But then at the end of that pa chat passage where people just kind of skip over that because Jesus is talking about like food and farming and harvest and what does this have to do with anything? But that's the whole point that Jesus says, you say four months more and then, and then comes the harvest. No, the fields are ripe for harvesting. So that it, it th there's an extraordinary apostolic impulse in this gospel. Uh, that 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 finds its fullest expression in John uh, 20, as the Father has sent me, so also I send you. So I think that's one thing, if you're going to go in that direction, that following is not just following Jesus, but it's following for the sake of, 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 uh, of bringing John 3.16 to fulfillment. <laughs> and that's not going to happen um, unless we get on board with that. So, yeah. Good. Next. Can we go to First Samuel. Sure. It's a great text for this weekend. I mean, this is the, um, in the United States at least, we're celebrating the birth of Martin Luther King Jr. And, um, and so here you've got the story of a calling of a prophet. Uh, there's also, I don't want to overdraw these connections, though I assume there will be some um, some buzz in the United States this week because the, there's an inauguration scheduled on the 20th of January. There's a sense of, of, of turning there. But to keep the focus on, on Martin Luther King, the idea of Samuel's calling, that here's a prophet who's called, and the first thing in the, the commentary on the website does a nice job of, of emphasizing this, that Samuel's calling initially is to root out abusive religion or to root out abuses in kind of the power structures of the day. Um, he's not yet called to go and anoint David. He's not yet called to, you know, be the, the prophetic um, kind of consort to kings. The first thing he's got to do is, is clean house, you know, is announce that God's going to clean up Eli's house. There's a, um, uh, uh, a, it was interesting because as I read the text, I really appreciated the commentary that Corey Driver wrote because I noted the same thing and maybe it's just the moment that we're living in. But Eli had failed in his own household and he had been entrusted with Samuel after having failed. And so it took a while for him to recognize that this call that was coming uh, to Samuel was was actually um, uh, from God to point him to God, and so that you, what you name that is so important, and what that means for us. If if you point to Martin Luther King, um, sometimes we think of him so much as a political or a social or a civil rights activist, we miss the fact that his imagination was that of the church. And we, we give it over to the government. And when everybody, anybody wants to criticize uh, the vision of King, they act like it was a political uh, agenda because they don't know what God's agenda always has been. And isn't that exactly what is said here is that the, the one who was to be the one who passed it on to the next generation failed to do that. And yet God calls anyway.
And when you are willing to listen to the voice of God, even if it is counter the voice of the institution that is supposed to witness to God, you can then bring hope to the world. I'm it's nice. Go ahead, Ralph. I'm particularly glad that we have this story in two different uh, formats uh, in the lectionary. Uh, one that ends the nice ending that ends in verse uh, 10 or uh, verse 10, speak for your servant is listening, the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. But then this version that keeps going, that talks about what he's commissioned to do, which is uh, first thing you got to do is fire Eli. Um, and especially for preachers, uh, we talked about Don Jewell uh, 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 last week, uh, one of my favorite teachers. This was his favorite Bible story. And um, he, he heard it as a child, ending at verse 10 from the, you know, from the children's book and said to his parents, when is God going to call me? Mm. There's, and Samuel has to help him know he's being called. And of course, um, in the hearing of the story, that's when Don was called. And he knew from a young age, he wanted to be a pastor. Um, one of our jobs as preachers is to help people or as ministers, I should say rather, is to help people hear that God is calling them. But then there's the next piece of the story where Eli, because uh, he, uh, his sons are scoundrels. And by the way, it happens to Samuel himself. Uh, in chapter nine, uh, Samuel appoints his, his sons to be judges after him but they're wicked and they don't follow his way. So then you get Saul, the first king, and then Saul is removed. So you, you get a series of people being fired uh, because they're not faithful. Eli, Eli's sons, Samuel's sons, Saul. And it is a good reminder to, to us preachers that, there, um, that while there is forgiveness from God of our sins, there are certain activities that will disqualify us and others from being public ministers of word and sacrament. Uh, and that's a good reminder too. Um, mm -hmm. Right now, there are uh, a couple of sins that society will not forgive in leaders uh, that will disqualify us. And uh, that's probably not a sermon uh, you wanna take out there, but it is a good reminder um, to us about God. Um, the last thing is, um, just to help everybody understand, even those who are not being called to public Christian ministry, that everyone is called. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's a, a nice angle for the doctrine of vocation that in baptism, everyone is called and everyone's vocation matters to God. Mm -hmm. I think too, going in, oh, go ahead, Joy. Go ahead. I think too, going into epiphany, I mean, it's another way to orient what epiphany means, what the season of epiphany means. Uh, the um, verse 10, you know, Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel said, speak for your servant is listening. Uh, that, that what if that were like the refrain up for epiphany? Speak, Lord, uh, we are listening. Speak, Lord, we are listening. And we are paying attention and whether that's listening or seeing or how, how we might, uh, how we might articulate that in, in this, in this season of epiphany uh, manifestation of, of, of who God is and what God is up to. But I, I was, uh, I was really attracted to that verse this year and thought, yeah, what, what yeah. What if that was sort of a epiphanous discipline? Woo. Um, uh, that that we just went through went through epiphany uh, with that with that with that request of God. If I if I could draw us back to um, the one that we are so familiar with in terms of the here am I, um, what does it mean to say yes um, for? Um, the, the failures of Saul and the sons of Samuel, th there was this repetition of their popularity, um, their prosperity, and, and just trying to maintain that status um, uh, where it, they lost sense of what their vocation actually was to do. 
And uh, that, that is a bit, Ralph, I think of what you were saying in terms of what disqualifies us is that our call is not to our celebrity status. Our call is to let other people hear the voice of God, see the presence of God. And that when we say, here am I, Lord, um, that's not going to be always just a wonderful day. It was difficult for Moses. It was difficult for Mary. It was difficult for Martin Luther King. It was difficult for Jesus. It's going to be difficult for us. And so when we say yes to this call, uh, sometimes it's important for folks to understand it's not going to be a celebrity status, but it is going to be a call to that truth telling that we talked about a week or so ago. In seminary, the, the joke was, uh, we would always say, here I am, Lord, send somebody else. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I know that line, too. Oh, that was, yeah. I think, I think that was, there was what Moses said. Yeah, I got yeah, a brother. Yeah, I've got to go to, uh, I've got to go to public speaking school first. <laughs> Should we go on to uh, First Corinthians? Let's go on to. Well, the psalm, I think, is a great. Oh, psalm, yeah, right. Great. Psalm, sorry connection to being known by God and in the Johannine text in particular, but, mm -hmm. but also the, uh, the calling of Samuel. Mm -hmm. I love what Shauna does with this uh, in that um, she is telling a very, uh, what, what could seem to be a very personal story, but if you pay attention to what she's doing, it's very communal. This is the birth of her nephew and the awesomeness is a reflection of the parents, which is a reflection of God. And I just love that circling of reminding us that this isn't about the individual. I have been wonderfully made. I have been known uh, from, you know, uh, when I was hidden in, in my mother's womb, but that this is a God who is reaching out to the world to go back to, to John 3.16. I love that reading of this text that so often we see individually and really I think should be read communally. Ralph, you might can help me with that. In, uh, in what way, the individual versus communal? Yeah, so often, you know, this is uh, uh, you have searched me and you have known me. And uh, we read that out of, out of my own sense of call, my own sense of vocation. And, and there was a twist, and maybe I'm just too lonely sitting here in quarantine since March, but uh, there was this twist in the way that I read the commentary here, where she told a story of the birth of her nephew. And then what she notices is that the greatness of her nephew is the greatness of his parents, and the greatness of his parents is the greatness of God. And so it wasn't about this one whose life is to be celebrated but the fact that this one is a part of community. And, and that was just a, that just struck me as a way of reading this text. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't sure um, what, uh, it, I agree, I wasn't sure what the question was because it was such a, you've answered it uh, so, so eloquently. The, I of course would add the second stanza. This is, a, this is a Psalm in four stanzas. There's good reasons not to add the fourth uh, because it's, um, now that you know I'm innocent God, uh, there's some people I think I'd really like you to um, drop the smack down on. Um, but the first three stanzas uh, are very appropriate. And I would add it, I mean, uh, you know, because they talk about God's um, omniscience in stanza one, God's omnipresence in stanza two, which is the one that's cut out. I think that um, uh, Shauna actually refers to some of those verses uh, that are that are omitted, um, and then stanza three is just about uh, really then God the Creator, and it's uh, wonderful the image of God as the image. You know, what are your favorite image of God? You know, uh, there's lots of them. Here's the only one I know of where God is a sower and then a weaver. Um, that um, you knit me together in my mother's womb, or in this case, uh, integrately woven, uh, it, on our website, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Um, uh, my teacher and godfather, Jim Lindberg, I, I wore a Norwegian sweater to class one day and he goes, nice Norwegian sweater, Jacobson. He goes, uh, was it hand knit? And I said, yes. And he goes, well, only uh, 
you know, he said something like, uh, you know, you're so-and-so can knit a Norwegian sweater, but only God can knit a Norwegian. Uh, you know, the idea that God is a knitter, a weaver, uh, is a wonderful uh, image, I think. Um, I, this, the, the, the poetry is so beautiful. I, I've never tried, dared to try to preach on it, to be honest with you, because it overpowers me. And I think I would just explain it away. Or what if you used it liturgically as the blessing and then changed the person to from first person to second person? Yeah, that'd be fine. You are, you are, you are fearfully and wonderful, wonderfully made. Um, yeah, that's the, wonderful, isn't as it? As the final, is the final, uh, final words to your congregation on that Sunday, on this Sunday. Nice Beautiful. move, nice move, which may move us to uh, Corinthians, or at least uh, something that uh, I notice in reading this um, is a sense of what is okay for me, but taking note of what uh, might make a difference uh, for good. And not just what is good for me, but what is good in a greater sense. Um, uh, so it, it, it circles back, I think, uh, appropriately for um, the who is following or who is seeing um, or who is called uh, from the gospel that was read. Um, that this is um, not just, okay, wow, this is good for me, um, but is it really, this is okay for me, but is it really good for the witness beyond myself into the world? It's such a weird passage to fall in here among these others. Um, um, and so we're starting four weeks in First Corinthians. So you got a little mini epiphany series if you want. But I think, right, you can do right. a, I think a preacher needs to explain the context like you're getting at, Joy, that Paul's contending with the Corinthians here about some of these slogans, right? They're saying, all things are lawful for me. But Paul's like, yeah, but is everything really good for you? And then so it's it's an interesting part of the argument to drop us into. But again, I'm going to try to like read it in an epiphany lens and say that Paul's Paul's argument here is don't you realize that you that what you do with your body is what you do to Christ, that there's this the, the, the connection between your own self and Christ is so intimate and so thorough. Um, so, you know, don't you know your bodies are members of Christ and then, you know, verses 19 and 20, this idea of uh, you've been uh, a body that you have from God and you are not your own, which is such an offensive statement in so many ways uh, for good reason, right? You don't want anybody else saying that to you, but when the one speaking for God might say that to you, that's, that's, that's interesting to deal with the offense, but then also to think of the magic in that if Epiphany's big question is how will Christ become known to the world? One of the answers here is through your own body, through your own self through your own relationships and commitments, through your own conduct, uh, the way you interact with the world, right? The way in which you, uh, your life, your bodies um, interact with others in good health and poor health, all that stuff. I mean, you can really do some things with that to talk about the deep sense of um, existential identification here uh, with Christ and with the gospel. Uh, uh, the reality of the embodiment of the gospel that this is not just words, it's just not a testimony, but it is a witness that causes other people to say, oh, is God here? Uh, yeah, let me jump in. We, uh, we've gone pretty long today, but um, I have to talk specifically about the, the reference uh, to prostitution or to sex workers. Um, I was uh, privileged to be part of a study called My Neighbor is Not for Sale, um, which is an anti-human um, trafficking study put out by LSS, Lutheran Social Service, Minnesota. Anybody can Google that, just my, put My Neighbor is Not for Sale study and you can download it for free. Uh, Matt mentioned this, you know, this we're coming up on Martin Luther King uh, Day. And um, well, one of the places the church can be prophetic is that there is still slavery in the world, especially in our context, in the form of human trafficking of especially young uh, of girls. And um, 
that this, I, I, I wrote on this passage for it. I was asked to talk about the supply side of the problem. Uh, why is there human trafficking? Because people, there's men out there who, who want to use uh, girls this way. And are, there's churches that, um, that are taking a stand and are making it part of the mission of their church to uh, stand up against uh, human trafficking in their own context that we are often blind to. And so I would just uh, mention, uh, this is, as Matt said, a weird place to drop down into Corinthians, but there is a very, there's a social evil going on now that the church can address in the spirit of the prophets. And what a different way to review the idea of you have been bought with a price. Who's bought you? 